We have all had painful events in our lives that can lead to depression, anxiety, addiction, or broken relationships. But here's a secret. It is not about what happened to us that causes suffering. It's the stories we believe about ourselves. Join us as we shine light on how to rewrite our stories, avoid the shadows of shame, and travel along the pathway to joy, love, and connection. It's the Finding Peace Podcast with your host, Amazon best-selling author, Troy L. Love. Before we jump into this episode, I wanted to make a special announcement about Season 5. We're going to change the format just a little bit. We still are going to have guests, and we still are going to tell stories, but for Season 5, I am going to walk some courageous souls through the Finding Peace worksheet a copy of which you can find in the Finding Peace workbook, which is available on Amazon. If you would like to be one of those courageous souls, then I just need you to go to findingpeaceconsulting.com forward slash podcast. There you'll find a button that takes you to an application where you can be considered as one of these amazing, courageous, beautiful souls that are going to bless the lives of a lot of people as you do the work. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. It is my sincere hope that you find support, solutions, and solace here. I can't believe we did it. This is the final episode of season four of the Finding Peace podcast. Over this season, we have had the opportunity to interview a lot of wonderful people from various walks of life, people that I've had the joy and opportunity to meet and call my friends. If you remember, episode one consisted of my buddy Johnny interviewing me, which was a little weird being on the other side of the microphone, being asked questions instead of asking them. But I asked Johnny if he's ever been interviewed before. And he said, no one has ever interviewed him. And Johnny has lived a very interesting life. He's gone through a lot of difficult challenges in his life. And so I said, I want to interview you. And so Johnny will be the bookend of season four of the Finding Peace podcast. Johnny Porter is the owner of These Guys, a marketing firm based in Arizona. And in addition to running the firm, he is also the host of a popular morning talk show on KBLU, KBLU AM 560 here in Yuma, where they cover issues related to politics, local issues, and current events. Before Johnny created These Guys, He gained valuable marketing experience when he was an independent rapper navigating through the music industry. Despite not having a formal degree in marketing, Johnny has learned skills and the the knowledge necessary to help succeed both in the industry as a rapper and then taking those very skills and using them to help companies become more well-known. He's been working in marketing for the last 15 years and is proud of the work that he does to help businesses grow. In Johnny's spare time, he loves reading, spending time on his mom's little farm hidden in the woods of Payson, Arizona, and raising two amazing boys. Please join me in welcoming my friend and buddy, Johnny. Hey, man. Testing? Testing? Is this thing on? Checking? I think so. Okay, cool. So at the beginning of the season, you interviewed me. And yes, sir. I get to interview you. My, 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 how the tables have turned. It's exciting. Yeah. I get to learn about you in a way that I haven't learned about before, maybe. Yeah, well, well, let's see. Let's, uh, you got some good questions lined up? I do. All right. Tell me your story. That's like a way to get into it. Uh, Like, well, what about my story? What do you want to know? Let's start at the beginning. Born in Yuma. 
Okay. That's that's pretty early. Born in Yuma. In Okie Town, if you're familiar, if you're from Yuma, you know where Okie Town is. It's uh, around a, a bunch of gang violence, actually. Yeah. That's Yeah, it was the gang area in Yuma. Were you in a gang? Yeah, for a little bit. I kind of had to. Had to be because it was in my neighborhood. I try to stay away from it as much as possible, but um, walking down the street just to go to school, you get approached by them, and they're kind of like if you're either down for us or you're not. So Got it. Yeah, so it's like, okay, I guess. But I wasn't, like, committed to it. I didn't go out and do a bunch of the nonsense. I just kind of hung out with them and stuff. And actually, you know, since I think I had, you know, a pretty good role model for a mom, I would try to tell them, maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe we should think about this before we go and break these windows. And, yeah, but. Did they listen to you? Um, No. <laughs> you would normally get hit. You would get hit and say, no, we're going to break these windows. And Got yeah, it. it wasn't. Uh, but it was kind of a protection for you a little bit. Yeah. So it was a protection from them. So they were the ones doing it. It wasn't like rival gang members or anything mm-hmm. that would give me problems. It was them. So then you kind of like, you, yeah, can't beat them, join them, I guess. Yeah. And then hurt the team by beating yourself. So, so it was kind of one of those things. That sounds really scary. Um, yeah, I guess been shot out a few times, stabbed and stuff like that. You know, that was, but it was, I was raised in it, I guess. So, so you didn't I don't, know any different. Yeah. I don't know if it was scary, scary, you know, I guess the, those times were pretty scary, but then you kind of go back out and do it again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you, you grew up in that environment and then what happened when you were a teenager? So growing up in that, um, I didn't like it. it. Didn't fit into it, right? It's like it was pressured into it. Um, thankfully, when I became a teenager, about fifteen or sixteen, I don't remember exactly. <clears throat> um, I hit on a chick at McDonald's, who later became my wife. She was telling me, "Hey, the only way this is going to work, you go to church." So, because I go to church, and she was there after church. Mm-hmm. And I was on drugs at the time, but I was going to church and still I was like, well, I'm, I, I go to church. Like, I'm good. I'm good. I was like, no, 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 no. You got to go to my church, whatever. Your church. Yeah, her church. her church. And so I'm like, all right, well, I guess, you know, that's what you got to do. You got to do what you got to do. End up going to the church and getting really involved. She got off the drugs. Somebody you were really interested in to dedicate yourself to that. Yeah. For sure. And uh, she did the, uh, she played the, what do you, like the cat and mouse thing. She played hard to get the whole thing, right? And so it uh, it turned into me going to church and getting really involved in the church and like it. They called it getting saved. You get saved. Um, I don't really use that word anymore, but they call it getting saved and you become part of the church. And even though I don't agree with all the stuff st- anymore, I don't see the world in that way it was a really good way for me as a youngster to get some discipline. Mm-hmm. Um, the church was pretty militant here in town called The Door. If you're from Yuma, you've probably heard of The Door um, or the Potter's House. So, but it was good, though, because it got me off of the drugs, right? It got me, it did. It worked for what it's worth. It worked. Mm-hmm. I went to church. I was a rapper before, so I started rapping inside of the church. You were a rapper before you went to church? Yeah, I was a rapper before church, and, you know, that's what we would do. Me and the homies would get together and rhyme. And, oh. And then when we when I went to church, they were like, well, we put on these little uh, dramas, and we put on these plays, and sometimes we have music. So would you be a performer? Would you be willing to do this? And so I kind of had my outlet, and I was like, oh, for sure. And I was a little bit of a different rapper. Like back then, most of the people that were going to the church were ex-gang members. Mm. Now, I never rapped like a gang member. I never, I wasn't into gangster rap. I was into East Coast rap at the time. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Wu-Tang, um, Gangstar. It's a little bit different. The lyrics are more intellectual. Mm. So it's a, it was a little bit different. So I was like unique. And so they really liked me and they used me a lot for a lot of their uh, outreaches. They would call them to help get other people saved. And part of the church. Did you 
I'm really curious about the rapping. Like, could you just do it from the top of your head or did you work on the lyrics? So I was really good at top of my head. I wasn't really good at writing lyrics. Okay. I was better from the top of my head. And because that's the culture I grew up in too. the, all of us. um, So that was kind of early, my early escape, I guess, from the gang was getting into the more hip hop side of it. Got it. Because they all listen to hip hop, but theirs was more like cholo and gangster rap. But there was another side of hip hop that wasn't that way. And so I started to gravitate to those people during that time. And uh, we would just rap all the time. We would just do that. We'd get high mm-hmm. and go to my room or go to a studio, go somewhere and just rap. And then off the top of your head, called freestyling. And then we just kind of get into a flow. And all of us in my l- l- little crew, we were all good at freestyling, but we weren't good at writing Oh, because it was a different part of the brain that you used to write than you used to freestyle. It was, it was difficult. Yeah. So once I started getting in a crew with like the good writers later on, they would write a song in like no time, right? They'd be good. Mm. They couldn't freestyle to save a life. And I was a battle rapper too. I would battle. I'd, I'd win money for battle wow. rapping. Yeah. Like Eminem and eight mile. Um, so they, they could write a song, but they couldn't freestyle. But I could freestyle, but couldn't really write a song. Mm. Like I'd write in lyrics, you, you write bars. That's how many bars. Um, it's the same thing with all music, but like we call it bars when you write the lyrics. And I'm, I like to write like eight bars, which is really short. Like I want to get in and get out. Like I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm already spent. And uh, so, yeah, that was, uh, that was something I did before and the, the writing. And I was more intellectual. And all my, and the reason why it took forever too, because all of my rhymes had to be very layered mm. and have Easter eggs and hidden meetings mm. and stuff. And the words had to like do something over here and do something else over here. The whole time. Yeah. So like for me, eight bars, which is half of a verse mm-hmm. on a song. So most songs have, most hip hop songs have like three verses. So I'm writing a half of one verse mm. and I'm spent. My brain is just tired. <laughs> Exploded. And yeah, I'm, I'm done. But um, yeah, so I'd rap in the church and uh, go around, do that stuff. And me and the girl end up getting married. It says she was my wife. And How old were you when you got married? 18. Mm. Yeah. Like, yeah, I was 18. She was 17. She was still in school. Mm. She was still in school. And so the church, they would, uh, they wanted everybody to become a pastor. It was like a factory of, uh, for pastors. And Got it. they wanted to take over the world or the, reach the world to say how they put it. <laughs> You'd become part of this factory. And if you liked a girl, you couldn't fornicate, right? You couldn't do anything with her because that's fornication and you go to hell for that. Um, so you got to get married, which I guess, you know, like, again, I don't totally agree with all these things now, but it was the thing that caused me to go get a job, mm. right? It's like, go get a job and then go put money down on a place to live and get your finances in order. So it worked. It was great. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I wouldn't right. trade it for the world, but don't agree totally with how they did it. Cause they kind of, you have to do this. And then your goal after that is to be a pastor. And so you have to start working along mm. that way to become a pastor and to become a preacher. So, mm. yeah. So that's kind of how things end up. And then the church had a big split. A lot of stuff was happening in fighting because it was a big organization. The, the large organization is Christian fellowship ministries, CFM. They started out of Prescott, and then they're all over the world, but there was a split. And so I took my wife at the time out of the church because I was like, okay, these guys are right. These guys are wrong. Mm. We're going to go this direction and stay part of the fellowship while the door where we're at was uh, going to go off on their own and start their own brand and mm. their own thing. And uh, that started some real big problems because that was her family. She was the way, she was raised there at the church. Mm. That was her. Um, that's everything she's ever known. And I kind of took her out and think something changed in our relationship when I did. I, I could mm. tell. And I wasn't a good leader. I didn't know how to lead. I just knew like, okay, I'm going to do this. And a man's supposed to lead. But I just went to the other church for a while until I didn't like it. 
And then we're kind of lost in a limbo in the thing and going from church to church or looking for something and could never really find it again. <clears throat> so the marriage ended up going south and, you know, here I am today. Mm. But how long were you married? 23 years. Okay. 23 years. So you, what was your first job? You said you went and got a job. What was your first job? McDonald's. All right. Oh, that's where you met her. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I ended up working at the place where I met her. Yeah. I got first it. job was, uh, first official job was McDonald's. Like I'd do a little stuff here and there, but first official job was McDonald's. And uh, I remember telling myself, or, and I got a lot of the leadership counsel from my, from the leadership in the church. And they would say like, just stay there for a year, promise yourself that you could stay there for a year and do your best and then move on but commit to do it. So I remember I committed to doing that. I'm going to stay at McDonald's for a year. And uh, it was exactly. I got an offer from, this was McDonald's. It used to be, uh, well, right next to it used to be the Radisson Hotel on 4th Avenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, the manager from Radisson came in and he said, I really like your customer service. You should come over and apply. So like right out, right as a year, I was able to go over there and apply, and then I quit and I moved my way up from there. Oh, so worked you, at Radisson. You worked in, in the hotel. Yeah, the hospitality. Hotel. Yeah, because yeah. he liked the way I, uh, I greeted him and stuff like that. So he's like, "I see something in you, kid. Let's go over there." Wow. So you were a rapper. Did you ever record anything? So I do have uh, some music available online. Like again, I wasn't really. Uh, so it was hard to write. Mm -hmm. I don't have rhythm. I'm not really good with rhythm. I'm good with words, but not with rhythm as much. So it, took, it takes a lot to get that because you have to go on the beat right. and the beat has something called pockets. You got to hit the pockets. And yep. like, there's this, this whole thing to it. Um, and then when you go into a studio, you have headphones on and we didn't have the best equipment. And so I can't hear that well. So it was like getting into the studio was always like a, I would sweat. I was mm. a horrible experience for me. I didn't really like it. Mm. So I don't have a lot of music out there. Um, created a lot of music, you know, but I didn't record a lot. What so, did you learn from that experience? What did I learn? Yeah. Well, to, if I want to record a song, I got to just persevere and then make it happen. And, mm. you know, yeah, I guess that's, that's one of the biggest things I've learned is that you just got to make it happen. You got to do it. Later on, though, I, I got to say, I ended up going to a professional studio and recording. It was night and day. Like I loved it. Oh. Like, but I'm already, this was like years ago, a few years ago. And so I would, uh, I would love to do it now, like to go back, but I'm older. And so I don't really have that same drive to do it. It takes a lot of time, but, um, yeah, recording in a real studio was like perfect. Like I can hear my voice. I can hear the music perfectly and mm. it helped out a lot. So you kind of wandered around spiritually speaking after you left. Tell me more about that journey and where you ended up. I completely left the church for a while, left everything behind. Oh, so as, as I was a rapper too, I started a Christian record label called Humble Beast. I helped start it with um, some friends out of Long Beach. And my brother-in-law was signed to the record label he was a Christian rapper who I witnessed to back in 2000 and got saved. You know, he got saved, the whole thing. Became a great Christian rapper. Um, and he had cystic fibrosis, and so he was declining at this mm. later in life. He started to decline. He would actually rap. Like rap actually saved his life because it made him use his lungs mm. and gave him a purpose for his lungs. And so he would keep care of his lungs. Up until one day we're in Phoenix performing. We did a show at the Stray Cats, which I like performing too. And we went to his parents' house to crash. Um, his dad and his stepmom lived in Phoenix. We crashed over there. I woke up in the morning and nobody's in the house. And I'm in Phoenix in a house that I've, I'm not really familiar with. Uh, I've only met them a few times because they lived in Phoenix. We're here in Yuma. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? And then I look at my phone. I got a bunch of, bunch of missed calls. And uh, so I called back. And he was married to my sister. So I called my sister. And it's like, oh, CJ's lung collapsed. 
after the show oh, wow. in the middle of the night last night and we're at the hospital. So then at that point, it was just was like a downward spiral for his mm. life. And um, I kind of got angry. This was like, we, we did everything together. It's my partner in rhyme. Like he was my best friend. So I kind of get angry with God and kind of take things in a different level, like mm. a different direction. I use my talents instead of like for the Christian stuff, which Christian or not, to me, it doesn't make a difference. Positive is positive. That's how I look at things now. If it's positive, positive. I used it for the negative. Mm. So it's not to me, it's like, to me, whatever faith you have, I don't care now. But I went totally negative to where I used it for the club and I went into the nightlife scene. Mm, like DJing. DJing, hosting. I would be like the person, what's up, everybody? Make sure you get, buy Joey some shots. It's Joey's birthday. What? Shout out to Joey. Happy birthday. Turning 39 tonight. I would do that kind of stuff. And Got it. I had to. It was advantageous for me to push the alcohol because I was getting a percentage of the bar. Oh. So that was my deal. Like if I go to your uh, location and make it happening, make it popping, I want a percentage of the bar. Wow. And the first place we went to was a place called Durrell. It was me. I was just a host, and I had a DJ. And I said, uh, if I do this, if I make your place happening, will you give me a percentage of the bar? And he's like, percentage of nothing is nothing. So for sure, like, it's not happening here. And so we did it. I ended up doing that for three years. Almost every night I was at the nightclub for wow. year, drinking. You drink because it's so miserable oh. being there. Like it looks like you're having fun. You have to make it look like you're having fun. And then people that are there, maybe one off, just having a good time. Maybe this is their one night a week. I mean, one night out of the month or out of three months. They're having a good time, right? They're letting loose. But I'm there every, every night. Yeah, every Friday and Saturday, right? And uh, I just drank because it came, became miserable. And then my marriage continued to deteriorate because obviously there was women involved there that mm. they, women love DJs and hosts. And, and so that's like an attractive lifestyle, right? Just for that reason. And uh, so, yeah, I just used it. And I remember one time, like when it got really bad, I remember it was one girl's birthday and I was telling her like, yeah, drink up, you know, have a good time. Well, she came back a month later, drinking, having a good time, and uh, she left that night and got in a car accident and died. Oh, wow. And I remember, like, hey, I'm on the mic telling these people to drink, you know, just saying these words and mm. just being very loose with my words. And and I remember, yeah, she passed away. She was a beautiful girl. I would, for my, uh, my other business with marketing, I would use her as a model for some things. And I just remember, like, whoa, what am I doing? And, uh, but it was how I was making money at the time. So I couldn't really just quit. Um, I, ha I did have my business, media management, marketing, but it wasn't good enough to sustain my family and stuff. So, how did you get started with that? With which one? The media marketing. So, the, um, so my first company was media management. I started with uh, my former business partner, Cody Beeson. He was a city council member. I used everything I learned in the record industry and the promotion industry. I used that for other people. Mm. I said, well, I figured it out. I knew how to figure it out. I knew how to market people. I knew how to promote them as a personality, as an artist. So then I said, you know what? I'm going to try my hand at doing that for businesses. Mm. And one of the first businesses I did it for was Ambiance Salon. And I said, hey, if I get you Yuma's Best, and this was years and years ago, if I get you Yuma's Best, which is a big contest here, would you tell your friends to hire me to do their marketing? She said, absolutely. There's no reason why we should get humans best. We're a little small hair salon. Like that's, we just started. There's no, I said, okay, let me handle it. So I used social media to drum up enough interest and in get in her humans best. And then she would go and tell people. And then I kind of just got clients. Wow. So you were doing two jobs working yeah. on the weekends and then so during the week, the marketing thing, and then on the weekend doing the the nightlife thing and 
you know, and at that time it was horrible. I didn't have any time for family. I didn't think I, I didn't have a good grasp on things. I didn't really have my, I had my mentor I'd go to sometimes. He was still there from the church. He ended up leaving the church. Actually, that's the church I go to now is his church. Okay. We were both from that former church and uh, we've both been on a journey. And, uh, but I didn't have that and I didn't listen. So my life just went downward spiral, continued to spiral down and down. I was anxious all the time. Didn't sleep right. You know, I needed alcohol to be able to deal with just going to work, mm. you know, and doing what I have to do because I knew like what I was doing wasn't good for people, mm. right? Telling them to drink. And then you would see the same girl there all the time and knowing she has four kids, mm. four kids at home. I feel like I'm talking a lot. That's the point. Right? Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, f four kids. I've never been interviewed. I used to have, you know this, I have a podcast and mm -hmm. I have a radio show yeah. and this is the first time ever. So it's weird to me. Like I get to talk. <laughs> Thank you, Troy. You're welcome, bro. Um, so yeah. And then that my family life just got worse and worse. And you would see the look on my wife's face that like, how can I deal with this? Like, I can't mm -hmm. deal with this or no, this isn't bringing any security to the home. It's always chaos. It's just mm -hmm. pure chaos in my home. And I just wanted to, you know, live the rock star life or kind of be famous, figure it out. I thought if I just made money, like things were going to be okay. And then one day I'd get out of this, you know. Mm. All of that is going on. Your life is spiraling out of control. I think I heard that you were homeless at one point. Yeah. So, yeah. So my wife left me. My wife left. She got the kids. We would fight all the time. And it was like, oh, this is just what we do, right? This is just a thing. But this one time, it wasn't the thing. Mm. It wasn't, there, were, there was no response from her. Um, nothing. She was gone. She was had enough. So right before that, though, I lost my business. Mm. I lost my business, gotten into a, a, a legal scuffle with my business partner. I ended up winning in court, but I wanted to, I, I had to get away. But the lawyer ended up taking all of that. Oh, So I didn't have, I think the last thing maybe that my wife was holding on to was the fact that I did have some money coming in, right? Mm -hmm. And not to say she's all about money, but just to say that, like, that was the last good thing I could bring to the table. You could provide for the family. I could provide, you know? And then it just came to a point where I couldn't even provide. Mm -hmm. You know, and I said, I think she just had enough, which is totally understandable as I look back to it now. Right. I totally get it. I don't blame her at all. No fault. Like, hey, I was living a horrible life. Yeah. So I lost my business, completely lost, gone, locked out. Then she left. We lost the house because we couldn't pay for the house. Mm -hmm. So lost the house. She had the car in her name. I didn't take care of stuff. So she got the car. All I got at the end was just a skateboard and I... Slept on my mom's couch. Dude. And that's the b bottom of the... And I remember sleeping on that couch just shaking. Mm. Shaking. I mean, night after night, just shaking. Like, what did I do? Mm -hmm. What? Where am I? What did I do? Just crying uncontrollably. And that point, I did have my mentor back. I would go to him. I would skate to his house. He lived close to downtown. So I would, it would be a few miles. I just had my skateboard. I'd leave my mom's house and go over there and just talk to him and say, what did I do? Where did I go wrong? And he wasn't judgmental, but he would tell me, don't rush out of this place. Mm. You are in the perfect place. Stay here. Don't medicate. Don't drown yourself in television and entertainment. And don't seek sensual pleasures to numb it. Stay in this place and die. Wow. And I remember I didn't like to hear that. <laughs> Who would I, want to hear that? Man? I said, I just want, tell me how to get my wife back. Tell me how to get my wife back and uh, make it easy on me. He said, this is what you need to do. And if you want to continue to this relationship, then this is what you need to do. I seen his life and his success, and I know where he's come from, 
back when I first went to the church at 15, we hit it off really well. He would, he would help me out a lot. Um, he would give me talks. We were close then. And so this is years and years later after I blew everything up, I did it. I listened to him little by little. Yeah. I, I got rid of TV. I didn't watch it. I've, I still, I don't watch TV to this day. And this was years ago. Got rid of the TV, didn't medicate, you know, didn't do those things, didn't go out and try to chase girls. I remember a few other people were like, this is your chance, man. Go hoe it up, you know? Yeah. Like, go, let's go to Mexico or let's go do this, let's go that. And I remember he would tell me, if you ever, if you don't ever want to be in this place again, you learn from it today and get all of that pain and all of that pain and just feel it, feel it outright. And if you feel it, that will keep you from ever wanting to come back here again. Mm. Powerful. Yeah. So now, like even talking about it on this podcast, like like I've tried to talk to my wife and say, like, you have no idea who, who I am now. Like, I wouldn't do that. The thought of doing that makes me sick. Mm. That thought, that pain is so still alive and in and, and real not in a bad way but in a like if i even think about veering off it's like that's what awaits me i know what's there yeah i know what that where that road leads and it's alive in me and even sometimes the slightest thought triggers that and says you you want this again no no all right <laughs> i'm done no no i don't so i did that i i, I became like a monk I just kind of cut everything off, read a lot of books, self-improvement books, uh, books on how to be a man, mm. something I didn't know anything about, something, uh, you know, my dad never taught me, but his dad probably never taught him. Like, I'm not throwing any shade or anything. Uh, yeah. So a lot of books, uh, a lot of uh, prayer, a lot of meditation. I learned how to meditate during that time and said, I'm never going to go back there. Never going to go back there. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to never go back there. Hmm. So, yeah, that's the the homeless thing. In that time, there was a blessing because my parents ended up leaving or wanting to go to Payson. My mom really wanted to go, and she called the shots in our family. So (laughs) my dad had to follow. She's like, we're going to Payson and going to go move into my mom's place up there because my grandma, my grandparents had a place that they just moved out of. And my dad said, okay. And then my mom, in in like a way of like, uh, there's no turning back, went and took me and signed the house over to me. Mm. So to kind of show my dad, like, we're not coming back. Like, this is his house. So in that journey, as I continued to turn and do things right, in integrity, I learned everything's integrity. Everything's intention. Everything is service. Everything is, if you want something, you have to give it. Mm. And in doing that, that's when I practiced that all throughout my life. And I was very slow and very intentional with everything. My parents gave me the house. So she signed the house over to me. And it was like a, it wasn't a very nice house at the time. It was in Okie Town. It was run down, hasn't been fixed up in years, but it was a place. It was a house. Like I got my own place. I had my own place. It was paid off. Mm. And that was part of, I think, me seeing that the, or it's evidence that my practices are paying off. Yeah. That was like the, one of the biggest in the beginning to show that my practices of whatever I put out will come back. Fast forward a little bit, the place gets totally remodeled. And it doesn't even, it's not even the same house anymore. Totally remodeled. Another, yeah, it's another miracle and those things that pretty rocky situation and how it went down, but it's a miracle that it's a new place, but that's where I live now. It's beautiful. No, thank you. So things have changed a lot for you. Yeah. Again, so how I view life and how I view spirituality, I uh, ended up searching for a lot of things out of the East, Eastern religions and stuff like that, which are, um, very complementary to Christianity and end up learning that Christianity does come from the East. Right. So 
we have kind of stripped it from a lot of those Eastern practices and, and that Eastern thought where things don't have to be so logical all the time and things don't have to um, add up the way we're used to making them add up. That's a very Western Greek way of looking at it. Right. That was influenced later that even Christ himself wouldn't have been a part of because he was from the East. Right. So I studied a lot of the East. I, uh, um, the Tao Te Ching, uh, my buddy, uh, Smoke, he's a rapper and a producer out of Washington. He, I got to just say, he, I don't know, have you ever heard of Macklemore? Mm-mm. Anyway, Macklemore is a famous rapper. So people know about hip hop on this podcast. They're going to know. He worked with Macklemore and he had a big incident with him and he got bitter because Macklemore blew up, but didn't kind of take the crew with him, take people. Mm. And there was a bad situation. And uh, on through Facebook, he saw I was going through a bad situation. And um, I saw something that he put up on Facebook and it said, rest in peace, Wayne Dyer. Mm. And I said, who's Wayne Dyer? Oh, and he kind of put rest in peace. Thank you for all you've done for my life, Wayne Dyer. I was like, so who's Wayne Dyer? He goes, oh, man, this book changed my life. I was in a bad situation. I was real bitter. I was angry. I was going through this. And Wayne Dyer wrote this book on the Tao Te Ching where he breaks down all of them in these these essays that he did. And uh, you should check it out. And so that was one of the first books that kind of helped me expand my way of thinking. And I saw, like, wait a minute, this almost sounds like the words of Christ. And Like this, if it wasn't for my prejudice already... I would say this is the same thing, you it's know, truth, truth. It was just truth. Right. And so that's one of the biggest things that changed because then I realized nobody owns truth. Mm. No religion owns truth. The Tao Te Ching was written before Christ. And the cool thing about it is they don't even care if Lao Tzu, the, the author even existed. Mm. There's no pressure. The pressure, that it could just be a made-up name to hold all of these truths. Mm. And then I'm like, well, this doesn't sound like the old thing I was a part of where Jesus is the only way, and if you don't accept him and say this prayer with me, you're going to hell. Mm. It was freeing. And it's like, these are the same truths. And But then I, I went to my mentor. He's a pastor. He had a church, and um, I would go to him off and on. And he, uh, he said, all that's in the Bible. Because I would go to him like, look, I found this out. And then, you know, I found this out. And look at this and look at this and this and that. I'd get chills just talking to him. And he's like, all that's in the Bible. I said, no, it's not, man. I, we know this. <laughs> like, no, it's not. You know it's not in the Bible. He said, try me. So I would say these things. And he goes, it's here. And he would flip to it in the scripture. And I'm like, huh? And then same thing over and over again. I would give him one. I said, how come, how come I've never seen it before? Because they didn't teach us these things. Mm. And they didn't teach them in the way that they were written. They taught them in a way that was advantageous to them and to keeping you as a member of the church. Mm. And so it kind of blew my mind to see all these things were kind of back at the place where I started. Yeah. They were there. And so I started going to his church, and I still go there to this day. And we have a Vedanta's Buddhist that goes to my church. You know, we have people from all kinds of walks of life. She actually helped start the, I don't know if you're familiar, you're probably familiar with the spiritual center Mm -hmm. here in town. Her her, her ex-husband started that. He was the first founder of that place. And her name's Vicky. And uh, Vicky goes to my church, and she's a Vedanta's uh, Buddhist. And so we have people from all walks. And yeah. But he preaches out of the Bible. But it's not like you're locked into this thing. You're taken on a journey with him through this thing. Right. And we'd be able to unlock the principles that are in it. And it's so much more freeing. It's part of that still free, that freeness I felt when I first read the Tao Te Ching. Mm. And it's like, if I just, you're saying live this way and it'll work out. Not live this way and have to say it the specific name. J E S U S, which you find out is not even his real name. It's Joshua. It's closer to Joshua. And there was another Joshua. There was nothing special about his name whatsoever at all. And sorry if I'm getting too much for the people on the podcast, but it's like, 
oh, we just live in the principles, which is what I've been doing mm. and which I've been seeing fruit from. And so, yeah, I love that. I, I do a podcast for him, and I know you're aware of that, Coffee in the Word. And I don't have to go to church. I get to go to church. That is quite the turnaround. Yeah. So I'm back. I'm back in church. It's a different, like I said, it's a different place. I wouldn't, I can't find myself into a regular church anymore that's trying to win souls or get people mm. saved or whatever. My pastor just wants to see people living good lives. Mm. And that's, to me, that's the, he doesn't take an offering. That's no, amazing. There's no hooks. Mm. And it's really changed you. Yeah. Everything I've learned is people are monkey see, monkey do. Mm. Not monkey say, monkey do. Monkey see, monkey do. That's just the way our brain's wired. Everything I've learned in psychology and throughout the years of being the monk at my house, uh, I saw him do that. And I was a recipient of those graces. Mm. So now, since I saw him do that, and I was a recipient of them, and I actually felt those things in my spirit, I can give them without hooks. Mm. Or at least to be able to recognize when the hook comes up. Right. And say, okay, what are you going to do here? Are you going to hook or are you going to mm. be free? Because, if again, if you look in the Bible, if you look at what Jesus real did, he would tell people, go and sin no more. He would heal right. them and then, okay, go be free. You know, he didn't have the hooks. Now, if you wanted to stay and learn from him, you could. But if you didn't want to, you didn't have to. To me, the gold is there. Let's let's go for it. Like, right. I, w- I want the gold. But um, So, yeah, that's what really changed me is the monkey see, monkey do, and watching him throughout these years. It's been a number of years now. And watching his life continue to progress. Mm-hmm. And when I mess up or even when I see him struggle, it's always the same. Mm-hmm. It's always the same. And it's always to a progression and to getting better in life. And it's not something to be afraid of or ashamed of. It's, all right, we're on this journey together. Let's move forward. I love that, dude. Being on the journey together. Yeah. And you've been on the journey with me, man. Yeah, we have, man. It's uh, It's been great. I remember, because I have a business again, for the people listening, I do marketing and stuff to help you. I remember we went out to eat. You're like, how do I become one of your clients? Yeah. I said, this is just be friends. Like, let's just... Yeah. That's how we do it. Like, that's it. And then it's like, okay, let's go. So, yeah, we've and been I'm on so, that journey. I'm so glad, man. All right. I have some ponderous questions. Okay. Some questions to think about. Was one thing about you that surprises people? A lot of times that I rap, that mm. usually surprises people, especially because I do a, you know, conservative talk radio show in the morning. <laughs> and, uh, I'm I'm around a lot of like older people and uh, politicians and stuff. And so when they found out I rap, it's usually pretty surprising to them. Yeah. Yeah. You can't see him, but Johnny's also lost a ton of weight, right? Yeah. Seeing pictures of you before and today, like that's surprising. 72 pounds total. You've worked your butt off. That was a lot of beer back in the day. A lot of the drinking, it just, it was horrible, but yeah. We've all faced a major decision in our lives that has resulted in us choosing to take a left turn instead of going right. When were you faced with such a dilemma and how did it work? I guess that was the day in my mentor's office when he said, are you going to die? And those are the words of life come or words of Christ coming to true die, right? Pick up your cross and follow me. So die. And that was the dying, dying to my old selfish ways, dying to those things. And they, it was really a death. And so I chose death and dying. I remember I would text him every once in a while. And he would tell me, just text me. And so I text him, I'm dying. You know, when I wanted to go out and <laughs> get with some floozies or do some stuff or drink or party or whatever and just kind of numb and self-medicate. And I would just sit there like, I'm dying. And I chose the chose the dying. I'm not perfect at it, but you die every day. So profound, dude. What book are you reading right now? It's uh, The Wall Speaks by Jer. I, f- I forget his last name, but he's Jer on Twitter. And I interact with him. It's pretty cool. Do you? 
Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been able to interact with them and talk to them on Twitter. And uh, it's a book about uh, masculine frame. Again, something I never had. And I think that was a big problem with my marriage. Right. Was the, uh, I didn't have that. I wasn't a masculine man. I wasn't a provider. I, I let her, I escaped my responsibilities and gave them to her because I thought I had to go live this life of an artist and be free and flowing and mm. had some, uh, artists don't do these things. These other people do it for them, you know? And then unfortunately it was her and she did it for a while. To her best of her ability, she did it, and that was wrong of me. And now I'm reading this book to be able to build that back up. And I constant reminder of like, that's not what men do. We don't do that. We take care of the stuff. We do it, and uh, that's what I've been doing. And that, yeah, it's a great book. Yeah, so I recommend it to all men. Uh, yes, you gave it to me. I'm reading it with you right now. Yeah. When have you felt the most alive? The most alive. When I'm on stage, I feel alive. Mm. Me too. That, yeah, we're, we're both pretty good at that. Huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. What's a daily practice that you must do every day? Walk. Why? So I would say meditate, but I don't do that every day. <laughs> um, I guess I meditate a little bit when I walk, mm-hmm. but I walk every day. I remember when my wife first left me, I couldn't sleep. So I would just walk and walk and walk until I got too tired. And I would just go to the couch and crash to the best that I could, you know? So I would just walk and walk and walk and walk. I mean, hours at night, just hours of walking and walking. And later on, I learned that a 10 minute, 10 to 12 minute walk outside is the same as taking a Xanax. Mm-hmm. It has the same effect. The The chemicals, the pharmacy in your body start to release the chemicals that are triggered from a Xanax pill. And so I've developed that years, years and years ago. And so this morning when I got up, first thing, 5.30, outside, it was freezing. I was all bundled up it's this so morning. Right I went, I went, went for a walk and it's like, oh, here we go. And, uh, but yeah, that's what I used to cope with it back then. But now I go and I kind of talk to myself and say my affirmations and do that. So I'll walk. Such a good example, bro. What's one question you wish that I had asked you and how would you have answered? Oh, man. Dang. I don't need, that's one question. Hmm. I don't know, man. I can't think of it. All right. What does finding peace mean to you? So finding peace to me means you're continually finding it. It's not something that we're even supposed to have all the time because life is the yin yang, right? It's the, um, you have to know what cold is to know what hot is vice versa, but it's something that you continue to go back and you visit. And that you're in that place. And then once you're in that place for a while, it's like it's time to go back out and be part of life and then with the toil of it. And then the next time you come inside that peace, it's a different experience. I relate it to, if you know, if you're from Yuma and you're listening to it, um, we get really hot here in the summer. Very. Very hot. But then when fall comes, it's like this... And we have this different respect for fall and we have this, this, we can't wait. We can't wait. And the anticipation, you know, it's gay. Oh, it's coming. Here comes fall. And then falls here and it's beautiful. And we get to relax and we get to have that peace, but then it gets really cold and then it's going to get hot again, but then the fall comes. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's what finding peace is. You, you, you know, it's there and it's coming. You just go through the life and you continue to go on that cycle. That Beautiful, journey. Beautifully said. Where can people find you? So, like I said, um, so AM560, if you're in Yuma, AM560, KBLU, you could listen to that. I do uh, I talk about politics, current events, um, all that fun stuff. Uh, so you could do that. Uh, you can also find us online. And then on Facebook and 
Instagram, Johnny Porter is what I go by on there. Used to go by Johnny Awesome back in the day. That was a, <laughs> that's what I wrapped on there. Um, but yeah, just Johnny Porter. So you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, J O N N Y, and then Porter, P O R T E R underscore. So all of the, all of the social media, same, same name. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. This has been interesting. I just feel like I'm talking so much. I don't get to do this. This is like a, a release, I guess. Well, I've wanted to do it for a long time. Thank Thanks you, for man. Making time. Thank you for the, the opportunity. Really, man. I, uh, it's so different being on the other side of this microphone. <laughs> so you did a good job, brother. Thank you. You've been listening to the Finding Peace podcast. If you love the show or want to ask a question, let us know by going to FindingPeaceConsulting.com. There, you can also learn about the Finding Peace 5-Day Challenge. Remember to subscribe to this podcast so you won't miss the next episode. And if you are listening on iTunes, please give us a 5-star rating. It really does help other people find this podcast more easily. Thank you for spending part of your journey with us. And a special thanks to Johnny Porter for producing the show and A.G. Flux for the new background music. Copyright Finding Peace Consulting.